Uh, so Acts 13, uh, we're going to be looking at, um, starting in verse 13, uh, and today what Paul really does in this particular portion of Acts is he goes to the synagogue, it's the Sabbath, it was Paul's habit to go to the, to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and I mean, that, that's, it was the Jewish tradition, and so he would go to the synagogue, and we'll show some of that in like uh, Acts 18 and, and, and other places. But uh, he would have been in the synagogue. And so we're going to read through the whole story because it's toward the end of, of a history lesson that he gives that I want us to grab attention to today. Uh, because it's, uh, I always try to look at things that are relevant in today's uh, culture, our society, and things like that. Um, and so he would have been in the synagogue. And so they, they, they see that he's there, and it's, it's, it's normal in the synagogue that they would open the scripture, read the scripture, and then they would roll the scroll up, put it aside. And typically they would sit and teach. Jesus would, so, would sit and teach. But in this case, Paul actually stands up and begins to teach in the synagogue. And basically... What he does is he uh, gives them this whole history lesson. He's reminding them of the whole history of the Old Testament and to come down to preach the gospel. The other thing, now remember, he, is, he had been traveling. Uh, where did he just come out of? Where were he, see if you can remember, where was Paul commissioned out of? We talked about Antioch, remember? And so they were commissioned to go out, him and who else? Anybody remember? It starts with a B. Barnabas. Okay. So he and Paul and, uh, are, are, and Barnabas are commissioned to go. And so this was really Paul's first missionary journey. Okay. So he's getting ready to go. And they go on their, their first missionary journey. And so they, they travel through. Herod dies. They travel through. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, they come to uh, the sorcerer, uh, it's um, uh, Seleucia, okay, I had to get it. So they come to Seleucia, and when he gets to Seleucia, he finds a sorcerer there, right? Remember that? And what does he do with the sorcerer? He just nails it, doesn't he? Yeah, he calls him the son of the devil, and he calls him some other things, you know. Um, and he accuses him of deceit and uh, deception and, and, and lying, you know, trying to deceive people. And so they just immediately, he immediately goes after the sorcerer and tries to tell him that he is wrong in what he's preaching. Uh, Paul was always trying to do course correction. It seems like Galatia, the, the church of Galatia. Paul, you know, he goes, you know, why are you guys turning back so quickly back to the old way? You know, you know the new way, and you're turning back already. Uh, and, you know, he's always trying to make course correction for the churches. Uh, the churches have a tendency to get off track, don't they? Uh, if, if they start to cater to the world, if they start to cave into the pressures, if the church begins to um, uh, become, I'll use a term for today, become woke, I was trying to say tolerant. It used to be tolerance. Remember, they, they, you know, we had to be tolerant. Now it's woke. And now, so terms just change. The meaning is always the same, right? And so, anyway, when a church turns to um, the world to try and tickle the ears of the people that come in, the church begins to drift, right? And it can allow bad doctrine and false doctrine and false teachings and so they were correcting this sorcerer for doing just that. And so then he travels right after this. He goes then from there, and they begin to travel to other places. And he ends up back in Antioch, Poseidon, Poseidon, Antioch. Okay, and we'll see all this. And I'm going to read the story all the way through because you're just going to see the history lesson that he's reminding them of as he's in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Uh, and then what I want you to catch on to, and I'll just give you a preface up, up, up front, what I want you to catch on to is after 
He gives this history lesson, what happens, okay? And you'll see this. He gets invited back, and then you're going to see what happens when he, you know, uh, and then that's where I want us to kind of focus our attention on this because it's just so prevalent in our society. It's so prevalent in the churches and the personal attacks that we, um, that we undergo in our faith. And you'll see that, you'll see what Paul and Barnabas did. Did, did Paul ever back down from an argument? Nope. <laughs> right? He, he loved them, but he would not back down, and he would not preach any other gospel but the truth of, the, of, the, of Christ. Okay? Somebody else, like who? I try. I try. I, I am not going to, I am not going to compromise. You know, I might lose half the people, but I'm not going to compromise. The truth is the truth. So let's pray, and um, we'll go from there. Lord, thank you so much for all that you're going to show us today. Open our minds and our hearts to receive your word. I pray, Jesus, that you'll just be glorified here. I pray, God, that you put on our hearts what we need to learn. Uh, talk to us individually. Talk to us corporately, Lord, so that we can do everything we can to glorify your holy name and to bring other people into the kingdom, to show the light in a dark world, and give us boldness to always speak the truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> so we're going to be in verse 4. Okay. Um, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, 13. 13. Sorry. Okay. So um, he preaches in Cyprus, and then Paul now comes to this place where um, uh, they're going to move on from it, and this is basically where this picks up in, in verse 13, okay? So in verse 13, it says, Now when Paul and his party set sail for Paphos, they came to Perga of Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to, where did they go? Antioch, Poseidon. And went into the synagogue, and it's on the Sabbath, right, on the Sabbath day, and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, this would have been their custom to do, okay? I lost my place here. Uh, after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men, men and brethren, have you any words of exhortation for the people? Say on. In other words, speak. Please speak. So Paul goes into this history lesson here. And goes, then Paul stood up and motioning with his hands, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. That's important. And I'm going to come back to this. It goes, men of Israel and what's the other group of people he, he just? Yeah. Oh, okay. So NIV says Gentiles. The, NIV, the, the King James doesn't do that. So it gives it away there. So he's talking to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And it's pretty interesting because people will say, well, the Gentiles aren't allowed in the synagogue. Well, that's true. They weren't. We'll get into that in just a minute. So how could the Jews and the Gentiles be there in the synagogue as Paul is preaching? I'll, I'll get into that in just a minute. But let's just look at the history lesson. Okay. Um, verse 17. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers... And exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. Remember, this is the captivity. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now, for a time, for about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. You remember this, the wilderness wanderings, right? So he's giving them this history lesson. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he just disrupted or disturbed their land to them by allotment. After he gave them judges for about 450 years, and this 450 years is probably uh, the wanderings, the 10 years of, of getting into the promised land, and probably 400 years of captivity. It's where he comes up with 450 years. Okay, But he's given them this lesson. See, all the Jews would have understood this in, in their time. But after about 450 years, until Samuel the prophet, and after they asked for a king. Remember? Give us a king. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. And remember they were warned, okay, you're going to get a king. Guess what the king's going to do? Anybody remember? What, what were they warned about? Anybody remember? You can go back and read the stories later, First and Kings, First and Samuel. 
they go, he goes, okay, he's going to take your, your, your men, he's going to put them in their army, he's going to take a t- uh, taxes, he's gonna, he warned them. They said, nope, we still, everybody else has a king, we still want a king. And so that's where King Saul comes in, and then David and stuff like that. Okay. So this is the history lesson he's given them. They would have understood all this. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Um, Okay, stop there for a minute. Did David always do God's will? (laughs) David had some pretty good flaws, didn't he? He did some pretty, pretty crazy stuff, didn't he? But why, why, was, why was David blessed with all the stuff that he did? Why did God bless him? It says it in here. He was after God's heart. Right? So, and, and the point to that I'm trying to make there is that when we sin against God, we should have true remorse in our heart. Not because somebody else caught us or we just got, you know, duped into something, but because we sinned against God. That's where we know that we can have true conviction. Okay. Uh, So he was a man after God's heart who will do all my will. Verse 23. From this man, uh, from this man's seed, according to the promise God, raised up for Israel a savior. Now he comes into Jesus. So we fast forward. It's Jesus. After John first preached before his coming. Now who is this? John the Baptist, right? The baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Who's he talking about? Christ. Okay. Men and brethren and sons of of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God. Now this is interesting. Those among you who fear God. So he's addressing two groups of people again here, isn't he? Sons of the family of Abraham. Who are those? The Jews. Who are those who fear God? The Gentiles. So basically, you could say anyone who believes, you know. And not everybody was going to believe. We'll see that in a minute. To you, the word of his salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are ready or which, which, which are read every Sabbath, and have fulfilled them in condemning him. <laughs> you know what Paul just said here? He goes, look, we come here to the synagogue, and we read the scriptures every Sabbath, and yet you still condemned him, and you still didn't understand, you still didn't see. You know? So he's reminding them of this, of, of what happened. And verse 28 goes on and says, And though they found no cause for death in him, They asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, written where? The Old Testament. A New Testament is not written yet, okay? Everything that was fulfilled about him, that was talked about him, everything in the Old Testament now has been fulfilled up to this point, right? They They took took him down from the tree and laid him him in a tomb. tomb. But God raised him from the dead. So now he's talking about the resurrection He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare, now he's making a declaration here, to you of glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And then he, really, uh, and then he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Okay. The seed of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Does anybody have a different version? Say decay. decay. Right. So the body won't decay. Okay. It won't decay. And then he'll make a comparison that David's body saw corruption. To only say corruption here is think of decay, but not Jesus. Okay. 
For David, he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, that's dying, that he died, okay, was buried with his fathers, and what? Saw decay, saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, that, though the, uh, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified for all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. This is huge, what Paul just said here. What's he saying? Let's read it one more time, 39. Right. But what were they used to doing? Just animal sacrifices, the ceremonial washings, um, the traditions, right? All of it. So this is huge, what he just said here. Then he goes on, Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come, up, come upon you. Behold, your despisers marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work in which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, so who goes out of the synagogue? The Jews. Who's left standing behind? The Gentiles. Who asked Paul to come back and preach? The Gentiles. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, and I point this out for a reason, when the Jews go out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them next Sabbath. Okay? Come back, Paul. Come back next week. Let's talk about this some more. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews... And these are the proselytes. What's a proselyte? Those who are new believers. These are now believing Jews. Okay? The proselytes. These are now the believing Jews. So they, these are the Jews that followed him out. Not the, Jew, uh, the non-believing Jews left. Okay? They followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Now here we go. This is where I want to get to. On the next Sabbath... Almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. So, so Paul, you know, goes, he's, at the, he's in the synagogue, the Sabbath, right? The, the previous week. He preaches this message to them. Some turn to believe and believe. The Gentiles are ecstatic because now what? Salvation has come for them too because the Gentiles are not allowed to go inside of the temple. There was an outer court for the Gentiles. What I, what I don't know is how they heard the message. They, Paul must have been maybe halfway in, halfway out. I don't know, but they heard the message. So they had access to the temple, but it would be wrong to take a Gentile into the temple. Remember, this is what stirred him up. Remember, in I think it's Acts 17 or 18, uh, we, we looked at this before where uh, they got really mad at Paul and they took him out. And what did they give him? What did they accuse him of? taking a Gentile into the temple. I go, and, and he didn't. They saw him with him. He was probably in the outer court, but they, they didn't like his message because in verse 38, that was a big announcement that it wasn't through the law of Moses that you're saved. Now your sins are forgiven through Christ. And so the non-believing Jews are going to go, uh-uh, oh no, you can't work on the Sabbath. You can't do this on the Sabbath. Uh, and they were accusing Jesus, weren't they? Why do your disciples not follow the ceremonial washings of hands and blah, blah, blah? And why do you remember when they went out and got wheat and they were, you're not supposed to separate the wheat from the chaff, you know, on the Sabbath? And they were, you know, and uh, so they're always trying to uh, get Jesus in trouble. And so Paul's confirming this. So these are some really big things. And so it perks their interest. Okay, so this, this is the huge thing that's going on here. And so now we've got the proselytes, we've got the believing Jews, and we've got the Gentiles. The other Jews leave, and the Gentiles, the proselytes, they, the proselytes, the new believing Jews, say, go, go great, you know, the grace of God be with you. The Gentiles, look what they do. They ask him to come back the following Sabbath, right? Come back and teach us some more, okay? So on the next Sabbath, the whole city. So the word had got now, <laughs> the city's in a buzz, and do you think that the, the religious leaders and the Jews didn't get word of this? 
And what do you think they did? They got a little jealous. And we're going to see this in a minute. They got kind of envious. Because I'm sure they couldn't draw the crowds that all of a sudden Paul was drawing now. The whole, almost the whole city came out to hear him speak. And so they got really jealous. They got really upset. You'll see this in just a minute. And so look in verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Listen. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy, jealousy. <laughs> they're probably thinking to themselves, how come he's getting all the crowds? How come they're not coming over here? Well, if you had the message of salvation, maybe they would, right? And so they did not like it. This is, this is where I want to kind of bring us into a little bit. It's a smear campaign. I called it on my notes here. I called it the smear campaign. What is it that the world does today when they don't like a message that's being taught, preached, or is in opposition to what they want? What do they do? Smear campaigns. Smear campaigns. How do they do that? Okay, they, that's, a, that's a, a source of how to get it out. Keep going. I'm going to pull it out. It's no wrong answers here, okay? Okay, they twist the words. Keep going. Okay, they're offended. Keep going. I want you to think this morning a little bit. What do they do? When they want to get rid of somebody and they want to discredit somebody, well, they do that. Yeah, yeah, they, well, yeah. False allegations. False allegations. We see it all the time. If, if they don't like the preacher in a church, false allegations. And what's the biggest thing that comes up? Sexual yes, sexual immorality. It's the first thing. So, but it's not the only thing. If they want to discredit somebody, if they want to get, get rid of somebody, they will, they will raise false allegations against them to discredit who they are to discredit their message. And so here's these Jews. Paul bringing them, man, the whole city. I don't know. I, did, I was going to look at the population at the time. I didn't get a chance to do that. I, I don't know what the population was. But almost, it says almost the whole city comes out to hear this message of Paul. And here's the, here's the Jews. They're envious. They're jealous. They're going, because you know, they, they probably couldn't draw those crowds, could they? And so they're filled with envy. And then the second part of verse 45, what did they do? And contradicting, so what do they do? They're contradicting what Paul is saying. No, 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 it's not Jesus that saves. You have to, you have to observe the circumcision. You've got to observe the ceremonial washings. You've got to do this and you've got to do that, right? If you want to be saved, you've got to do these things. And, and you know, uh, so... Uh, they start contradicting Paul. Then they begin to blaspheme, you know, against God. And it says, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. They opposed him. They didn't like the message, did they? They didn't want the message. And so look back down to verse 38. This was a, that big thing I was telling you about. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, that's Jesus, is pre, uh, through this man, Jesus is preached to you for the forgiveness of sins. What? Jesus can't forgive sins. You have to do this, 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 this in order to have forgiveness of sins. So this is a huge thing Paul is talking about here. And so they, the Gentiles, invite him back the next week. He comes back, and now, now, now the, <clears throat> you know the whole week, everybody's talking. Shh, 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 everybody's talking, going, probably going house to house, and, and pretty soon the whole town is abuzz, and, and then the Jews are probably just getting angrier and angrier. And go, what is this going on here? And then they go to see this Paul that, morning, that, that day, and all of a sudden, almost a whole town is there to listen to Paul's message. And they get jealous and envious, so they start to contradict him. They start to oppose him. They start to raise false allegations against him and try to preach a different gospel. 
And remember what Paul said? If I ever preach another gospel, let me be accursed. But whoever opposes it, let them be accursed. Okay? So this is a big deal. So in verse 46, did, and this is what I was asking earlier. Do you think Paul and Barnabas backed down? What did they do? It says they grew bold. They stood up for the truth. In the church today, you know what they do? Okay, I'm sorry. I, won't want, I don't want to offend you. I don't want to do anything that's going against our culture, and I don't mean to, you know. And so the church goes off course and direction because they have no ability to be bold to preach the truth of the gospel. They're too afraid of the world, aren't they? And so we have to do everything we can to make sure that we preach the truth. It doesn't matter if it's popular or not, right? Truth is truth. And if you believe that the scripture is inerrant, that the scripture that we read is truth, then we have an obligation as Christians, as believers, as pastors, as leaders, as, as whatever, to preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you can, I can guarantee you that if you preach against what other people don't want to hear and they will oppose you, they will raise false allegations against you, and they will try to destroy you, and they will try to tear you down. But do what Paul and Barnabas did here in verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it. (laughs) He didn't, he wasn't only, he's looking at the people that are angry at him and envious. You rejected it. But since you reject it, let me find my place. And judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Oh, I'm sure this made the Jews really happy, right? You can't preach this, Jesus, and forgiveness of sins, right? For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles. Paul, right? that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified with the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. They believed. There was conversions going on. They believed in Jesus Christ. Salvations were happening. But I think the issue that we have today is that we don't, the church doesn't, they're afraid to oppose the world. Because let me tell you, as you know, you can see it on, it's ruthless out there. I mean, it, it's possible to be thrown in jail. False allegations. Opposing the message of Christ. And then we would stand up as, as they're opposing, and they're, and false allegations, and we stand up and says, this Jesus, you rejected. <laughs> right? You think they're going to like that? Mm-mm. They want power and money and authority, and they want to keep it as long as they possibly can. Don't they? So, um, there's these false allegations now that are, are brought up uh, but this isn't the first time. I mean, they, they did it here with Paul. They did it again when he went into the synagogue that one time when they accused him of having a Gentile in the, in the temple. They brought up false allegations against Stephen. Turn over to Acts chapter 6 just for a moment. Let's look at verse 8. So false allegations is the way of the world to destroy somebody. Okay. Uh, I'm in seven here. Look at Acts. Okay, Acts chapter six, verse eight. Let me read it for you. And Stephen, and you everybody know what happened to Stephen? He was stoned to death. We're going to look at why he was stoned to death. 
And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders as a sign among the people. And there, were, and, and there arose some from what was called the synagogue um, of the freedmen. We talked about all this. Uh, okay, we won't get into the freedmen and all that stuff. Cause we already talked about that, okay? The Syrians, the Alexandrians, stuff like that. There was a dispute with Stephen. Verse 10. And then, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit at which he spoke. Then what did they do? They secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him, seized him and brought him before the council. And what did they do? They also set false witnesses up against them. What did they do? False allegations, false witnesses against Stephen. And because of all of that, they stoned him to death. This is why I'm bringing this up. Because the word of God, when we bring it up in wherever we are, uh, at the schools, in our workplace, in politics, in our homes, what happens is is that when you are opposed because you're not speaking the words they want you to hear, or they want to hear, if I said that right, they will immediately try to tear you down and you, they will start saying false allegations against you. They will do everything they can to silence you. And many people will just back down and say, okay. But not Paul and not Stephen here. Look at this in verse 13 again. We also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. Here's the law again. What's Stephen preaching? The sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. It's all about the law. It's all about the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Oh, okay, there it is. You're going to change our way of life. You're going to change our customs. And all this out in the council, looked steadfastly at him, saw his face, and he had the face of an angel. False allegations. False witnesses. I, gu- I, I guarantee you that this will happen to the church. The question is, What is the church going to do when that time comes? Does the church stand or does it peel back? Um, This isn't isn't what Stephen did. It's definitely what Paul and Barnabas did. And and it's definitely not what Timothy did. And uh, they preached the truth. And so if I'm preaching the truth to two people, then that's what I'll be doing. I'll preach the truth to two people. But I won't back down from the gospel. Because it is the truth and it leads to salvation. Right. One of the can, one of the, um, and of course, we saw what happened to Stephen. So one of the commandments in Exodus 20, and you find this in 2016, one of the commandments, it says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. So you, right there, <laughs> Stephen, they're complaining about the law, changing the customs. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Aren't you violating the law? They violated their own law because they didn't like the message. Do we do that today? Do we violate our own laws because they don't like the message? Absolutely. Every day we do it. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is truth. Truth exposes the darkness. Darkness doesn't like to be exposed, and so therefore they fight back. And they will bring false allegations against innocent people. See how this works? Very interesting, isn't it? And so when you see all this stuff going on in the world, false allegations, false witnesses, false things, know that this is just the way of the world. Let me just end with this. Um, in James 4, 1 through 3, it says, what, what causes fights and quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have. You commit, uh, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. <laughs> What's that mean? That's all about me. It's all about me, right? It's not about God. It's all what I want and what I pursue. 
We need to pursue the things of God if you truly want to live a blessed life. Don't cover your neighbor's house in Exodus 2.17 or 2017. Um, don't cover your, your neighbor's wife, your male servant, the female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything your neighbor has. Don't envy what the other person has. If God blesses him, praise God. If he blesses you with a nice house, praise God for that. Don't envy it. You know, everybody's going to, you know, but use it to the best of your ability for him. And then uh, wrap up with Matthew 5.11. He said, blessed are you, this is Jesus, blessed are, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. So Jesus is saying, it's going to happen because of me. Blessed are you if you stand firm. That's, that's my, that, I just added that. That wasn't part of scripture, okay? Blessed are you if you stay, stay true to the Holy Spirit. All right, let me pray. I'm running late. So Lord, thank you so much for all that you do today. I pray God that you be glorified. Thank you for your word. And I pray God that we'd be light in darkness. And I pray God you show us the way. I pray God we would be bold in our stance. We would be bold in our uh, commitment to you. We would be bold, Lord Jesus, to preach the truth no matter what. Thank you for all that you're going to show us today. And bless this day and bless this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.